In the 80s, breaking into the metal music industry was hard enough, even more so if you were a woman, and especially if you were in an all-female band. In fact, the band considered to be the most successful all-female metal band of the 80s is one you still probably don't know much about. So today, we're going to take a look at the history of Vixen. Vixen was originally formed in 1980 by guitarist Jan Kuhneman in St. Paul, Minnesota. I started the band in Minnesota and the original band moved out to Los Angeles. And one by one the original members left the band and we all met up in Los Angeles. Jan would be joined first by singer Janet Gardner. I was playing in a bunch of different bands in LA, a couple original ones, a couple top 40 ones, stuff like that. And then Jan came, came to see me play one night and then I joined Vixen. Before getting any airplay or signing with a label, the band would make an appearance in the 1984 beach comedy Hard Bodies with the on-screen name of Diaper Rash and playing more of a pop rock sound. And they don't just make an appearance, they're seen throughout the movie and even put on a concert at the end after they change their name to Hard Body. It's a good change. Over the next couple of years, Vixen would go through a few lineup changes, ultimately bringing on Roxy Petrucci on drums. I played in a heavy hard rock, heavy metalish type band called Madame X, and then Jan stole me out of that band too. And Cher Peterson on bass. I was playing around Los Angeles, just doing yeah. like side side musician type gigs playing for different people and Jan saw me in one of those bands and gave me her number and here I am. <laughs> Vixen had no real problem getting gigs, but nailing down a record contract proved a little more difficult. Very easy to book gigs, but hard to get the actual record deal. Oh, you wouldn't believe the story. Some of them were, um, we had a girl band that failed, so we don't want to even think about another one. And some would say, well, we already have one. They didn't say whether they failed or not, but it was like, one's enough. They had their token girl band on their label. They found every excuse not to sign us. Uh, they just didn't take it seriously. I do remember record companies being very, very hesitant. Oh, people aren't ready for, you know, a hard rock female band. They'd finally be signed to EMI in 1988 and begin work on their first album. Released in September of 1988, Vixen's self-titled debut is a mix of flashy aggression and hard rock pop that's a bit lighter than its tough cover art might imply. Whose leg is that? It's, it's my leg. It's your leg. I just happen to have the coat and the motorcycle. Plus, Vixen's management had the counterproductive idea of bringing on several outside songwriters and producers to write songs for the album. We should have been focused on, let's keep the writing in the band. No outside songwriters at all. We don't need it. Why are we doing that? The more people you involve, the yeah, harder it is. We didn't have one producer for the album. We had what, four. four. Their first single, Edge of a Broken Heart, was actually written by Richard Marks, who isn't exactly known for his hard rock songs. We were kind of nervous and excited at the same time because it was our first video. Um, we had that video camera too, and we did a couple weeks with that. The little um, that's right, the little granny funky day in the life of Vixen kind yeah. of stuff, which was really we had fun. fun. That one was fun to do because it, it was our first. Yeah, we didn't mind getting tired or doing the same thing 50 times. Don't get me wrong, I like this song. It is very poppy and overproduced, but it's also undeniably catchy. And Jan's solo was awesome. Vixen's second single, and also their biggest hit, was Crying, written by two other dudes. The video for this one is almost identical to the video for Edge of a Broken Heart, except this time there's an audience.
Vixen's third single was Love Made Me, written by three other guys. This video has the band a little less glammed up, and there's some creepy dude with a camera running around. It's never confirmed, but I believe this might just be Vixen's photographer who was running late. What we'd like to, the audience to get out of that video was that Vixen is not unreachable. We don't always wear tons of makeup and, you know, we're just a real band. That was the down-to-earth video. So it's just Vixen low-key at rehearsal jeans. All of these tracks are good, and overall, so is the album. But with all of the outside writers and producers, it does seem like the album kind of got mansplained away from the band. And so you end up with, you know, an album that sold a lot, but as a band, did it represent the band that I joined? In my opinion, no, it didn't. The best two tracks on the album are the ones that two actual members of Vixen wrote, Waiting and Cruisin'. I would have liked to hear more stuff like that. I think it's a pretty good record as records go, but why isn't it great? Um, because it doesn't sound that passionate. They should write more of their own songs. I mean, they just should, because they do basically a better job of sounding like they're having fun on their own song than they do with the songs that uh, guys out there gave them. When you think about it, Vixen actually wrote more songs for the Hard Body soundtrack than they did for their own first album. Despite all members of Vixen being clearly skilled musicians who played countless live shows, they'd immediately be met with skepticism and constant questioning of their abilities, simply for being an all-girl band. Roxy was even hesitant to join at first, in part for this reason. Until Janet sent me the tape, and I listened to it, and I said, God, this sounds really good. But then, I hate to say this, I didn't know if it was them playing on the tape. So, so it's that old thing again. Yes, yes, I admit it, I thought, thought the same thing. <laughs> for some reason, though, this question of whether they could play or not would remain a talking point throughout their career. Some of them, you know, before they see us play, a lot of times they'll yeah. go, oh, phew. Bimbos right. from hell. Yeah, they call us bimbos from hell the other day. In the beginning, I think, yeah, they were looking at us as pretty girls, but they can't help but hear that we can play, too. Although I have to admit, I'm not really sure why anyone would think women can't play the guitar. Girls don't have the strength in their wrists. Huh. Well, the 80s had a lot of weird ideas. Aside from proving they could actually play, Vixen was now also under pressure to prove they could actually write. I, I hate even talking about the way that it, it worked out on this one, mm -hmm. but um, definitely next record we'll, we'll have a lot more of our own material. The new Vixen record is called Rev It Up, and that's exactly what we did on this one, is we revved it up. We, um, after touring for like a year and a half, came off the road and said, we're taking three months off so we can write this record. That's what we did, got together and did some writing. So for this album, every track is at least co-written by one actual Vixen member, except for one song by Diane Warren. Rev It Up does feel like more of a hard rock album than the first Vixen album. The singles are still poppy, but they also sound more focused and, you know, written by a rock band. Plus, the guitar has more of a presence here rather than just making guest appearances for the solos. That was the kind of set where we all walked in and went, whoa, wow. you know, this is cool. And then awesome. when you see the screens and you see the guys on the screens taking their yeah. shirts off, you see us on the screens. And with our shirts on. With our shirts on. <laughs> <laughs> the second single, Love is a Killer, gets a music video that tries to go for this film noir idea. It's 
really dramatic, it's really moody, it's in black and white, it's got a great Alfred Hitchcock character in it. There's some old dude who hires a call girl, and things get pretty steamy for a bit. And I'm remember, topping this image up, but damn right. it! And the, the first We're time too squeaky that, clean! <laughs> got bondage, we're gonna sell bondage with this video too. <laughs> The final single from Rev It Up was not a minute too soon. In the video, we keep seeing a tech guy in the rigging above the band, and then there's an electrical mishap. This dude is in peril the rest of the video. He's swinging on cables, dodging fire, hanging off of pipes, while the band just plays below him. Then, he defies physics to leap over to another cable and slide down to safety. You know, people really don't realize the sort of stuff techies go through. With Rev It Up, it seemed like Vixen had a more established sound. But as it turned out, not everyone was on the same page. It was a tough time because we, Cher and I had been writing and we had really started to get something going that was a lot more rootsy and a lot more sort of just what we were feeling at the time. And me and Jan kind of started writing together. Then you could tell there was a little bit of direction change going on there. Mm -hmm. You guys went off and did your thing and then her and I went off and did ours. And then we put it together, it's like, oh, we're not headed in the same direction yeah. here. And we didn't sit down and go, okay, what's the sound of this album going to sound like as a we band? We never that. sat down and did no. that. This sort of miscommunication and getting dropped by EMI would eventually lead to Vixen's breakup when they had a band meeting regarding either adding a new guitarist or kicking Jan out of the band, depending on who you ask. I guess there was some talk of like getting me out of the band. And, and talk of, you know, maybe bringing in another guitar player to play my parts and stuff. And I said, you know, I don't like that either. The first thing I remember hearing is um, we want to bring in another guitar player on our next record. And I'm like, what? It seems that Jan felt it was a prelude to her getting kicked out of the band, while Janet claimed she only wanted to try adding a second guitarist. It was always to add a guitar player. There was never, we never even discussed anything but that. So that's, but I guess I didn't probably see it like that, you know. Yeah, that meeting at that restaurant didn't resolve anything. And then it was done. It was a done deal. Despite the breakup, Janet and Roxy would get together to release what would amount to the third Vixen album, Tangerine, in 1998, without Jan or Cher. Yeah, Roxy called me. What are you doing? I said, Absolutely nothing. Did you guys reach out to, to Cher and to Jan to join the, the new project? Of course. Yeah. Nobody called me or mentioned anything to me, you know, and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Cher wasn't interested. We called Jan and she wasn't interested because I wouldn't do it without my partner. Gina. Gina. That would be Gina Style, who Roxy had started playing with and introduced to Janet. She'd go on to play lead guitar on Tangerine. We actually called Jan to see if she wanted to be a second guitar player. Lead, they'd trade off leads, but she wasn't interested. And if you're wondering, Tangerine sounds like it came out in May of 1998. Very Southern California alternative rock. The album came out in 1998. Yep. Right. July of that year, you heard from Jan. She decided to sue you guys for going out with that name. She said, you're not using the name if I'm not going to be in the band. And we said, well, yes, we are. <laughs> so July of 98 rolls around, and you basically sued them for copyright infringement, right? <laughs> yeah. The four of us at the time still all owned the name, and I just didn't think it was right that no one had mentioned it to me or asked permission to sign off on or asked me to be included or anything. It was just, it just felt wrong to me. We begged her to do it. Right. It's not like we just left her out. We begged her to participate. 
and she didn't want to, and then did that. That was upsetting. Jan would eventually put out her own Vixen album in 2006, Live and Learn, with a whole new lineup. This would include Jenna Sanzaguero on vocals, Lynn Louise Lowry on bass, and Kat Kraft on drums. This album definitely goes in more of a hard rock, heavy metal direction than Tangerine did. And it's not bad. Plus, I really like the album cover. The songs overall are decent, but the highlight is definitely Jan's guitar playing. The members of Vixen did some touring together after this, and there were allegedly plans for an official Vixen reunion with all the original members. Sadly, Jan would be diagnosed with cancer before that could happen and would pass away in 2013. Janet has since left the band to focus on family and a solo career, but Roxy and Cher have continued on as Vixen, now with lead guitarist Britt Lightning and newly acquired singer Lorraine Lewis. They have an album tentatively scheduled for a 2020 release. And that is Vixen. Mismanaged and underrated, they're still a huge milestone for women in hard rock and heavy metal. Your homework for this week? Vixen from 1988 and Rev It Up from 1990. I'm also going to put Live and Learn under extra credit. If you like Jan Kuhneman's guitar playing, you'll probably like this album. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of Vixen in the comments. And see you next time. Rock and roll, okay? We'll see you next week, metalheads. Okay, take care. Yeah. Right. Rock and knock pop. Woo! <laughs>